This is Tim Ventura from the American Anti-Gravity website. I'm here today with Bill Alec from Intallic.com. Bill's done research into a number of free energy and over-unity processes, as well as some research into gravity and gravity reduction devices. Uh, Bill, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, I can. Hear. Yes, I can, Tim. Oh, great. Okay. The, the reason that uh, the reason I thought you, the interview with you would be um, just so worthwhile is because your research is very unique, um, especially in relation to a lot of the other things that are out there. Um, I, I've seen a lot of work with Einstein's research, uh, a fair amount based on quantum mechanics, but you have a fluctuating mass theory for, for uh, I think that's what it's called, right? Yes, yes. I've been developing this theory uh, for uh, a few years now. Um, it's based, uh, the origin of this theory uh, can be traced back to uh, some uh, Jean-Louis Naudin's work a oh. few years back. And uh, there were some, a few other researchers involved in this. Um, and basically what it was uh, is changing the, uh, uh, the energy uh, in a coil, okay, by uh, moving a mass, okay, uh, a ferrite core, uh, through this coil, and he presented a paper um, a few years back that uh, detailed this, and he discussed some of the theory, and he called this uh, parametric power conversion, and uh, the theory discussed not only the kinetic aspect of it, but also uh, this parametric aspect. Oh, okay. Could you tell me a little bit more about how, how that might relate to gravity? Well, uh, according to my research, um, the kinetic aspect of uh, uh, electrodynamics and uh, electromagnetic theory, uh, you know, taught in colleges, uh, mainly focus on the kinetic uh, side, where you have uh, the energy stored in a coil as uh, uh, one half. Uh, L I squared, okay. And what uh, Jean Louis uh, experimented with uh, was this other half of uh, uh, of the equation, where uh, you varied the uh, the mass of the system, and you have this added energy uh, to this equation. And that's what I started picking up on. And I wrote a paper last year and presented it at uh, Bruce Peralt's conference um, that at the time I called parametric mass fluctuations, but I recently changed it over to gravimetric uh, mass fluctuations because it doesn't really involve parametrics uh, uh, per se. It, it involves uh, either side of this equation, which is uh, gravity, gravity control. Well, you know, I, I attended the conference last year, and <clears throat> I was very impressed, actually, by two things in your presentation. Uh, the first being that, that unlike many of the, the people uh, doing theoretical work or hypothetical work out there at the moment, um, you're actually not afraid to do math for it, and that's always a big plus. And, um, you know, I, I can understand why a lot of people are hesitant, um, you know, because you, you can have a perfectly good theory but make a slip up on the math, and, and people can sometimes write it off as a result. But... Um, one of the things that, that surprised me in a really positive way was when you did the presentation, you were showing equation after equation after equation. And also in the background, and this is kind of an uncommon rarity, uh, at least from what I've seen, not only did you have math, but you also had another device that you brought with you to the conference. And it, it's somewhat of a rarity to see, uh, to see people who do both types of work and, and kind of bring them together. Yes. Uh, well, well, the devices that I brought with me to the conference, um, this device that I've been experimenting with is called the Z-Pod. And this is based on a Russian researcher by the name of uh, Nikolai uh, Zayev. And the design of this device, um, I actually was able to trace it back to, uh, you know, going back to Jean-Louis' work again. Uh, some experimenters uh, experimenting with uh, these coils and uh, these rings of coils wired together. And it, what what Zayev showed in his paper was that uh, uh, you could pick up excess energy. And his analysis 
analysis dealt primarily with uh, excess energy through changes in permeability. And I've done a fair amount of analysis on this, and I built a, this device called the Z-Pod, and I actually observed excess energy being produced by this device. And the, the way that it collects this excess energy, uh, I think, is very similar to how the MEG operates, uh, Tom Bearden's MEG device. Oh, okay. I, I found some correlation there. And what it is, it's h how you get this excess energy is simply by uh, uh, Letts's law uh, uh, being transmitted into this, uh, this, this core material. And the Lenz's law causes uh, the core permeability to increase, okay, uh, essentially saturating the device. So really when you pulse this device on and off, okay, you don't pulse it to the point where uh, you drive the coils or, or, the, or the magnetic material. Uh, you, you don't overdrive it, but you use Lenz's law to overdrive the system. And when that happens, uh, you, you acquire this excess energy. And uh, I'm at a point in my research where uh, my next step is uh, transferring this energy from the secondary side back over to the primary. And that, that, that's, that's what I'm still uh, experimenting with. But I observed over Unity, uh, which is pretty close to what Zayev uh, was talking about in his paper, uh, between two and three, a COP of between two and three. Oh, okay. And he uh, he experimented with some other materials that uh, have even a higher COP. I think reaching somewhere around uh, ten ten times uh, the output. So it's just a matter of uh, choosing the materials uh, where you see this very high permeability and uh, just basically driving these devices to extract that excess energy. You know, it's it's an incredibly interesting line of research, especially with relation to, um, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, solid state transformers. Uh, you know, I, I'd read about magnetic flux in college, and it always seemed theoretical because the cores that it transmits through are always solid, and and therefore it's, you know, it's only detectable by instrumentation. But um, I, I'd actually seen a version of the mag, and it had a primary and a secondary magnetic circuit. And the, uh, they weren't permanently attached in this case. So prying off the primary was incredibly difficult, and the secondary was easy to pry off. But once you had pried the primary off, the circuit switched, and it became incredibly difficult to pry off the secondary. And, and once I saw that in action, I was able to understand exactly what the device, at least to some degree, I was able to understand what the device was doing. Do you think the Z-Pod is similar to that? Uh, yes, I do. Um, the input, you'll notice on the MEG that the input has these tiny um, coils uh, that, that act as gates. And the secondary, um, you'll observe that uh, you use heavy winding, uh, a heavy gauge, okay, but they're very large windings. Okay, they're high inductance, large windings. And I, and I have this very similar configuration with the Z-Pod device, okay, where my input, um, well, the configuration of the coils are such that uh, the same number of turns I have on the primary, okay, matches the secondary, okay, but my secondary s side is just the opposite of what people are taught in school, you know, how, how to design transformers, okay, you use just the opposite. Oh, okay. Set of rules. Okay. But the the way that they operate is that you have this very low inductance input that, that act as a uh, like a flux gate. And then the output are wired, all these cores are wired in series. And what I discovered is that Barkhausen effect is actually a gravimetric effect. Oh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, as the uh, as as you increase the magnetic field on this magnetic material, you know, as you increase the field, uh, the Barkhausen effect is such that uh, all of a sudden the magnetic domains line up. Okay, and it's it's like a in in 
it, it, if you hooked up an audio uh, receiver to this, you would hear like crackling pops, okay, of magnetic domain switching. And all of a sudden, they switch on, and these magnetic domains line up. Oh, and, okay. So instead and of... And what happens is that you have this phenomena called magnetostriction, okay, where the material physically changes its size, okay? Sure. And yeah. it changes its size in such a way that, uh, you know, with these domains lining up, uh, they produce what... What I think is a, is it's a gravitational effect. You know, okay. it, it it makes sense. I, it makes sense. Go ahead. Oh well, it, it actually just reminded me of something uh, Richard Hoagland had mentioned, and I don't know if it's completely appropriate, but he had he'd suggested that um, the extension of De Palma's work with uh, anti gravity research um, might be taking the the rotating masses and uh, centrifugal precession in gyroscopes down to an atomic or molecular level and taking this spin effect that seems to cause a reduction in gravity uh, down to just you know the level of, of maybe a single atom and um, you know since single atoms are magnetic in nature you know um, perhaps uh -huh. aligning them all and uh, and putting input energy in might be causing some precession or you know otherwise uh, effects that could influence for lack of a better word space time on that level yeah. Uh, well, well, yes. Uh, well, I think this is all related. Um, you know, but going back to this magnetostriction phenomena, you know, as being gravitational, this I think is the primary phenomena that's occurring. I refer to this as a mass fluctuation. So since it's, it's involving gravity, okay, you have to draw in, uh, you know, some of Einstein's work here, okay, which gets into uh, uh, SR and GR. Yeah, and this yeah. is what I've been looking into lately. Well, I I can definitely see you know you've drawn an even stronger parallel between this device and the Meg, at least in that, you know the Meg is actually using um, molecular domains also for the magnetic switching. Um, it, it, I guess it has to be so because you have a magnetic field running through the Meg and you have your primary, and when it switches to the secondary circuit there has to be at least some magnetic domain movement in that device for the magnetic uh, field to switch. And right. so it, it makes sense that the Z-Pod would be similar in that um, you know, once the domains actually physically realign themselves in the device, which would definitely produce a crackling because they're, you know, they're, they're definitely not atomic. They're, uh, you know, uh, little balls of molecules. And so if there's movement, you know, that was, it would be something we'd hear. Um, it would make sense that if there's a magnetic circuit at play there that we would hear noise and it would have some, some comparable uh, effects to the mag, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, you know, all these devices are all related and it, it comes down to this magnetostriction effect and also electrostriction uh, in dielectrics. Uh, there's also a counterpart to this. But the uh, but but you see what an engineer is taught in school is that with the coil, you know, you have power in, you know, equals power out. You know, a simplification of that concept. Um, but when you put a core, if you if you just take an ordinary coil and then you put a core in this, you observe that the efficiency of that of that coil core system increases. Okay, and your maximum efficiency, you know, cannot exceed 100%, okay, because the power in, you know, equals power out. Sure, sure. And some of these coil systems, I mean, they can go up, uh, you know, very high efficiencies. I mean, I've heard, uh, heard as high as like 99.4%. But you see, there's something very interesting here, and that is this increase in efficiency. And this is where this, uh, uh, you know, this Barkhausen effect comes in, where where gravity comes in. Okay, enters the picture, you know, and that's that's uh, this magnetostriction effect. Oh, now is that because of the mass fluctuation from the domains, or 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 is it just a uh, semi related? Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, things are aligning, and the device is physically changing size. Okay, and when a device physically changes size. All of a sudden, you enter Einstein's world of relativity. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, 
you know, this is where I'm crossing over from electrodynamic world, okay, in, into Einstein's into Einstein's world of relativity, because now we're physically changing the size of something. Well, it could be magnetically or electrically. I, I and I, I think that I've also seen some papers on electrical, um, electrically based designs that have. Um, if I remember, there was one that was just a, a spherical-shaped uh, device drawing that had uh, pluses on the outside and, and, if I remember correctly, minuses on the inside. The the idea being that if you changed the uh, the electrical charge, there might also be some mass fluctuation. Is that um, is, is that kind of the electrical counterpart to the Z-pod? Um, well, when you apply a field, okay. Um on, on ferromagnetic material, okay, is where this magnetostriction effect occurs, and you physically change the size size of this material. You know, like muscle wire. Oh, sure. You pass sure. a current, okay, and the material changes physically in size. Okay, that's all gravitational effect. Oh, okay. Okay. See, now you're entering into Einstein's realm of relativity. Okay. And this is uh, this this is uh, what I'm what I'm currently researching now. Yeah, uh, you know, your research recently took you to uh, California, and uh, you went to the gravitational mystery spot in, I believe it was Santa Cruz, right? Uh, yes, I've heard about this phenomena on a coast to coast program a few years back. I don't remember the uh, uh, who the interviewee was at the time. But he starts talking about these mystery spots, and I was very intrigued by it. Uh, what he was discussing, and he had, he, he had mentioned that the uh, the flow of time was a little slower in these spots. So that that got my curiosity going here. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, I I saw the video that you put together, and it was an excellent video. And, and you you are selling those on the web, right? Yes. Yeah, yes, and, uh, they're on my uh, website. And it was it was well worth the money. Um, you know, one of the things that that I thought was uh, just amazing was I almost expected, um, just I guess as as an unconscious assumption that the mystery spot would be out in the middle of nowhere. And um, people have actually done some development in that area, and they they built some structures to try and illustrate, and in in some ways, you know, uh, enhance the appearance of this effect. And uh, the video it actually made me a little bit seasick just from the, <laughs> the angles and perspectives. Now, I know it sounds odd, but for some reason, I, after watching about only about 45 minutes of the video, and it was it was longer than that, um, I actually had to get up and get some water and then you know pause it for a few minutes. Um, so it was it, you know I I looked at that as kind of the the mark par excellence for uh, uh -huh. for for demonstrating the effect on film. Well, uh, my objective was to capture, you know, the essence of the effect. Okay, uh, I, I spent about four days there, and um, I took so, uh, actually several tours, and each tour guide specialized in a particular area of the spot. But uh, Ethan, uh, he, uh, tour guide Ethan, he, he, I, I think he's worked there for about a good 10 years so he spent quite a bit of time there studying this phenomena and he was a, a, a physics student at uh, UFC uh, of Santa Cruz and he gave uh, an, what I thought was an excellent tour and he highlighted all the uh, really interesting effects and the phenomena occurring there and he calls the phenomena a directional deviation of gravity where we look at gravity as being up down, okay, but at these mystery spots, gravity isn't up down, it's at a slight angle. Sure. Well, and, and he had mentioned that the USGS had actually measured what this deviation of gravity is. And uh, he mentioned that it was like 12, 12 seconds of arc, you know, which is a very tiny angle. Well, you know, one of the things that was interesting in the video um, was, in, in a way, it's almost a, <clears throat> it's almost a mini theme park that they've constructed around it. But they have they have a house built at an angle, and they have several structures with just geometric ev elements that that uh, enhance this effect or, or enhance its appearance. 
Um, but one of the things that couldn't be simply explained away was actually a pendulum hanging inside. And, you know, some of the other effects are things that I had actually seen that reminded me of uh, psychology test bo textbooks. Um, for instance, uh, two people stand on a board and one appears smaller than the other. Um, it, and, and I actually saw something similar in a psych textbook. Um, but the pendulum was really amazing because there was really no explanation for that. And you would, you would let it go and it would swing clockwise for a while. And then after a few rotations, it would actually just spontaneously reverse its direction of rotation. That's right. Yeah, that, that's the effect of this uh, directional deviation of gravity. Yeah, and, and where you know it act, it's it's acting on a swinging mass of, of that pendulum, and it, it's such that uh, uh, it, it it swings in one direction, okay, and then that gravity is acting on the uh, uh, on the mass of that pendulum there, and it starts swinging in the other direction. Sure, and sure. I've actually videotaped the uh, the pendulum at the uh, Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago, and I show how normal pendulums act. And what what essentially happens is that the Earth rotates under the pendulum, you know, as it swings back and forth. Oh, okay. You don't see that happening at all in a mystery spot. Oh, in other words, because the, the gravitational, for lack of a better word, center of gravity is uh, stronger there and directionally stronger with an offset. Um, yes. It's not going to have the same, uh, I, I believe, just Coriolis effects that a regular pendulum would have um, just hanging from the museum wall in Chicago. Um, yes. The, uh, yeah, the forces that are acting on it, you see, this directional deviation of gravity is actually changing the mass of that pendulum as it swings back and forth. And you can actually hear that in the video. You know, as it swings in one direction, it, it, it sounds heavier. You know, the creaking noise, you know, as it swings back and forth, uh, the pendulum sounds heavier, okay, in one direction than when it swings back in the other direction. It sounds lighter. Oh, okay. Okay, so the pendulum, uh, it, the physical properties of that pendulum are changing as it swings back and forth. Yeah, that, that was actually detectable in the video. And again, I should just put out there for anyone um, who, who listens to this, it's, it's well worth the money just to see the effect in action. Um, uh, there was a wooden beam, a rather large, heavy beam that it was um, secured to. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I thought when it started to counter-rotate, my immediate thought was, well, maybe it's the rope twisting and then, you know, and then twisting back. Um, almost like if you twisted a if you spun a, a ball attached to a string, uh, you know, eventually it would begin to spin reverse as the string unwound. But uh, in this case, it was secured via a bolt, wasn't it? And the, the rope actually didn't twist. It wasn't allowed to twist. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't see the, uh, the pendulum uh, spinning at all. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, was just hanging freely, but it was just the mass swinging back and forth. Sure. Um, yeah, it was. It was. It's been an excellent. Uh, it was an excellent watch. I, I definitely was just amazed when I walked away. Amazed and, and again somewhat nauseous just from uh, the perspectives <laughs> in it. You know, but it, the the filmmaking also that you did on that. Um, it, you know, you said a few times that it was a four day event, but it came together rather well. It actually looked like it all took place in about um, you know an hour or two space of time. Uh huh. Well, the main attraction at the site. Um, is what they call a shrink growth phenomena, and that's what really intrigued me um, when I, when I first observed it. And you know, if you study that very carefully in the video, okay, you'll see that there's a slight lean. Okay, when you first enter the spot, you'll you'll see people have a lean. Okay, as opposed to the people standing outside the spot. That, that are standing vertical. Oh, okay. Now, that's but, some... you, but you actually see this lean, which is really curious. And that's this deviation of gravity that's acting on, you know, people and objects. 
you know, even, even the trees, you know, have this l visible lean to them. It, it, and that that would make um, that would make sense. It, it would also be, it, um, it's also interesting from the the perspective of, <clears throat> I've often read that one of the things that makes human beings unique is that standing upright is actually quite difficult for most animals, and that uh, humans have an innate sense of balance that allows us to do this, but in in an altered gravity field, um, our bodies wouldn't be able to tell, um, and so our, our just innate sense of balance, you know, just the, the inner ear filling with fluid and the body's subconscious reactions to keep us upright, which is apparently a fairly well-coordinated process that we take for granted and don't even pay attention to. Um, would definitely set us at a lean in a gravity field. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, the the effect is really strange uh, as you close uh, as you approach the center of the spot. Um, I mean, you don't know whether to stand up or fall down. <laughs> I mean, you can actually feel uh, the curvature of space time inside your body. You know, it's it's really strange. Oh, that is interesting. Uh, well, the effect is it's most pronounced inside the uh, uh, inside that little building that they have there in that second room. Sure, sure. You know, as you walk through the through the building, uh, you can actually feel the the curvature of space time, you know, inside your body, and it's like I mean, you don't know whether you want to stand up or fall down. <laughs> well, you know that that actually gives you good experience also to go by in terms of. Um, you know, one of the things I've wondered with uh, some of the different devices that, that people have discussed online and their claims for a variety of different experiments, um, some of the claims have been that, that perhaps these devices, um, you know, such as maybe the Searle effect or others, are producing a high gradient gravity field around themselves and that you have normal gravity outside of it and uh, some type of altered field on the inside and, and what it produces is a perimeter of maybe a few inches or a few feet where you have a gradient. And it sounds like um, you would actually be one of the few people who has experience standing in one of those fields and knowing what it feels like, um, you know, as opposed to the rest of us who might look at it and say, well, it's something that, that perhaps could be measurable, but, but it's interesting to hear your perspective on how it actually felt to stand in it. Well, the, uh, the mystery spot is something that I actually measured because I brought instrumentation you know, to this site and this instrumentation was actually recommended by uh, Richard Hoagland. Oh, okay. Because, uh, uh, you know, he was researching uh, De Palma's work, and De Palma used an Accutron watch um, and, and his rotating devices. And he observed that time would flow slower, okay, uh, on his watch. So... Um, Richard Hoagland picked up on this and then uh, sent me a few emails recommending that uh, that I take an Accutron watch with me, okay, to the uh, to the uh, to the mystery spot. And I found a um, company in California that makes uh, a device that gauges these watches, okay, that looks for drift in the flow of time, okay, with the watch. Oh, okay. And I set up a little experiment. Um, that uh, uh, used an Accutron watch and then it has a little sensor okay that uh, picks up the 360 uh, hertz signal okay, from the watch and this little meter box okay and the cable length is uh, uh, roughly the uh, the radius of the of the mystery spot uh, uh, you know in California there which is about 150 feet 150 foot of cable so I actually measured um, this slowing down of time uh, using this uh, this little box and this Accutron watch. Now the Accutron watch uses a, a, a toning fork, okay, which uh, uh, you know outputs a frequency which is based on vibration of of this little toning fork, which oh, is really okay. a function of mass. Sure. So what I'm looking for is a change of mass as I walk into this spot that's going to change uh, the vibrating frequency. So uh, how much did you uh, how much did you detect in terms of change? What was the set um, percent? Well, the meter read about eighteen uh, about eighteen. 
millihertz change from outside the boundary, okay, to the center of the spot. Okay, I, I measure, measure an actual slowing down of time of about 18 millihertz, okay? So if you do the math, it turns out that uh, um, the slowing down of time is about 3 minutes 40 seconds per day. Oh, okay. okay. So, you know, arm, armed with, you know, a slowing down of time, I know that the mass increased in the watch. Um, I'm going through uh, uh, Hell Put Off's paper that he wrote of all these space time metrics that change, okay, in a relativistic fashion here. Uh, he wrote a paper a few years back that lists all the space time metrics that change according to general relativity. Okay, so I would observe a volume change, which, which you do at the spot. You know, things get smaller. Uh, they become more massive. So mass increases. Okay, gravity increases. Uh, the frequency decreases. Okay, so time intervals lengthen inside the spot. So this... I mean, all these parameters are telling me that, you know, that the phenomena is really gravitational. Sure. Okay, and sure. they behave according to relativity. But you see, there's a problem, okay, with Einstein's uh, relativity. And this is what I've been uh, researching here lately, uh, are the flaws in SR and GR that simply do not explain the mystery spot, you know, this gravitational mystery spot. Oh, now, would it, would it be because the deviation in some ways is greater than you would expect from relativity, or is it just stuff that relativity left out, do you think? Well, uh, GR, if you apply GR to the mystery spot, you find out that you're miles below the surface of the Earth. Okay, they, they have the equivalent gravity that is being um, uh, radiated, maybe, <laughs> in the mystery spot. Uh, that would put you uh, at a radius of uh, miles beneath the Earth. Oh, okay. okay. Now, if you apply that same analysis with SR, being in that mystery spot, you're moving at 60,000 miles per second. Okay? So both theories, SR and GR, cannot be applied to the mystery spot. Okay, so this requires a new relativity to explain this phenomena. Well, you know, it, it makes sense in that, um, you know, all of the gravitational measurements so far have really been conducted in a, a field that, you know, is very similar to the Earth's field. And, um, you know, deviations from that are where the really interesting effects would happen. And it, it makes sense that, um, you know, d despite the fact that the math tends to line up um, in the textbooks, it makes sense that there will be deviations and exceptions that wouldn't be captured. I mean, you know, Einstein was, I, I personally think he was a brilliant scientist, but at the same time, um, you know, he didn't have that much more to work with than any of the rest of us do, <laughs> at least in terms of experimental data. I, I, I recall he used, um, he used a train as one thought example and an elevator as another, and these are the kind of materials that he had to work with. And, and so by finding something different, by finding something that is, is previously... It was known, but not really explored. It would make sense that you would find perhaps loopholes or inaccuracies or just things that were plain wrong. And you know, all of the all of the relativity examples that I've seen uh, tend to be rather massive uh, interstellar objects. And it could be that small changes <clears throat> or small inaccuracies in the theory just wouldn't show up at those scales, or that that perhaps. Um, Perhaps they wouldn't be known at those scales, but you know it, it makes a lot of sense, especially with um, you know they they're currently having a debate over missing mass in the universe and uh, dark right. energy, and so physics is coming up short in a number of ways, and and perhaps this is one of the answers. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, well according to my research here, you know I'm developing this new relativity. And it's, uh, it's, it's based on some of uh, this recent work here by Paul Marmot. Uh, I've been reading his work, and he's bypassing uh, you know, Einstein's uh, work here. And you know, his, uh, his work seems to be making a lot of sense to me.
me. Although I've been picking up some, uh, you know, what I think are some little mistakes he, you know, he's making. Um, only because I have, you know, an actual place to try this out. You know, uh, you know, the gravitational mystery spot is, is for real, and you can conduct experiments, you know, at, at these places, and uh, and get real results. Okay, I don't really have to develop a theory of relativity, okay, and then later on, you know, somehow test it astronomically, you know, like what they're doing now, uh, I can actually go to a place and uh, experiment, okay, and then develop the equations uh, uh, from, from that perspective. Sure, sure. It, it's, it's a big advantage in terms of experimental evidence, and you know, from my experience working with lifters, um, you know, when you actually see these things, it gives you a much more holistic perspective on them than just working with them. And, or then, I'm sorry, than just looking at them, you know, on, on a TV screen or in theory. Um, and, and so actually having been there, probably, uh, you know, it just provides the kind of sensory input that, that your mind can store. And uh, hopefully in the future, when you see something you know, that perhaps it's out of the ordinary, it, it might ring a bell and you could say, well, this is related or this isn't related or you know, maybe, uh, maybe you know, as time passes and new experiments come to the public knowledge, um, some of the, the perceptual information that you have from having been there will become invaluable in, you know, um, relating back to what other people claim to be seeing with their devices. Exactly. Because then I can apply this to free energy and anti-gravity. Okay, and and come up with a better relativity to explain these devices. Um, I mean, for example, I mean the mystery spot. If if you look at all the space time metrics, okay, you begin to realize that energy flows into this spot. Okay, it's a decrease in energy. So that means that if you go, if if you reverse the gravity field, okay, you're moving up into higher potential. Okay, so rather than energy decreasing inside the spot, if you reverse that, okay, and decrease gravity, your energy is going to increase. Oh, okay. okay. You're going to observe blue shifting of frequency. You know, energy will increase. Now, you can take that concept and then apply it to these, uh, to the, uh, uh, to free energy, free energy devices and anti-gravity. <laughs> sure, sure. And um, develop, you know, not only a theory, but actual, you know, how the device actually works. Okay. And what I've been able to come up with is that if energy increases, okay, um, then then I should be able to extract that energy. Oh, okay. All right. So if I decrease the gravity. You know, in this device, I should be able to collect that energy as excess energy. Well, you know that that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> also, in a kinetic perspective, um, I mean, it, it would be clunky and it wouldn't look pretty. But even having a rope connected to a pulley connected to an alternator, if you were able to reduce gravity on a, a bowling ball and send it up into the air and then turn off the gravity decrease, um, you would be able to generate power that way. So it, it stands to reason that there might be solid state or other approaches to do a similar or, or identical effect with uh, something that's you know, a little bit more elegant, maybe. Exactly. And that's what occurs in ferromagnetics. Okay, you're decreasing, okay, the permeability. Or in, in magnetic devices, the permeability is actually increasing in space. Okay, so your, your system is actually blue shifting. So it's how you configure your system, okay, you wire your system to take advantage of that phenomenon. Oh, okay. Well, how much energy do you, do you think it might be possible to produce one of these devices? Uh, well, on a device like the Z-Pod, you're limited to the amount of flux that can be carried inside of magnetic material. Okay, you're limited to the you're limited to the materials that you're working with. So it, it might, it might. I don't know if this would be accurate or not, but for instance, uh, right now we have 
hydroelectric dam generators. Do you, do you think if someone had constructed an alternator of the size used in those, that it might be able to generate a similar amount of power as they do, except not w without obviously the water passing through or the, the rotation? Um, well, it's, it's all scalable. Okay. Um, they have uh, actually came up with some numbers that uh, can be scaled up or down. And I forget what they are, but uh, you know, so many uh, kilowatts per cubic meter. Okay, but if you can scale that up, okay, um, then of course uh, you can increase the, uh, you know, the excess energy here. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, he was talking about a size to run a house, uh, about the size of like an average refrigerator. You, know, you have a machine the size of a refrigerator running uh, an average size house uh, using known materials. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and then it definitely stands to reason that, you know, if a first-generation device the size of a refrigerator could do it, I, I'm sure that, you know, after just a few years of producing something like that, they could have something the size of maybe a personal computer that could do the same job. Exactly. You know, and, and that would be, uh, you know, for vehicles also, that would be amazing because energy sources are always in short supply for vehicles. And, you know, um, as much as I love the big V8, I think that... <clears throat> that era in transportation is coming to an end. So. Well, I think so, too. Um, you know, once... Uh, see, see, my direction is along the lines of engineering, okay? To be able to engineer a, uh, a free energy device or anti-gravity device, okay, you need a, a theory to work with. And that's probably one thing that has been lacking, uh, you know, the past 20 years know in this field uh, is a working theory of uh, what's going on and the real snafu in this area uh, is how mass behaves in, in a relativistic fashion okay and that you know what Einstein did okay yeah you know his his work works okay but it it doesn't explain you know, other relativistic phenomena such as free energy and anti-gravity. Sure, sure. Okay, so now, um, you know, a researcher in this field has to take his work and then, uh, you know, come up with something practical, okay, to explain this other phenomena, which is all relativistic. Well, and I'd always thought that, that relativity in some ways, um, in, in a way, always undermined itself perhaps a little bit with uh, angular momentum. Um, I, I still, I, I've heard several conventional theories that explain centrifugal force, but, uh -huh. you know, from a relativistic perspective, if Well, they... you know, I've been researching that too. Oh, oh have and you found... what I found out, okay, now this gets into Richard Hoagland, uh, you know, his hyperdimensional theory. Okay. And he mentioned uh, on Coast to Coast the other day that with this new experiment uh, that they just launched into orbit here to measure, uh, to measure, uh, do some GR measurements, okay, that they're going to discover uh, phenomena, okay, that's going to be related to Richard Hoagland's hyperdimensional model, okay. And I had recently sent Richard some some of my theories, you know, with this hyperdimensional model what it really is and what I found out uh, was that SR if you look at SR it's correlated to velocity and what, what I found out was that um, if you have a change of, of this velocity okay it's going to be a first order SR equation okay and that's acceleration so you can take this acceleration and apply it to Newton's law Okay, of F equals MA, and that A term is a first order SR effect. Now, if you look at all the all the uh, space time metrics that change according to SR, okay, which is volume, time, you know, gravity, mass, uh, SR is really a gravitational effect. Sure, sure. But it's but if you accelerate that mass, you're going to have a first-order SR effect. And I think that this SR effect of 
acceleration is correlated with these mystery spots. Okay, that a mystery spot is a uh, is what I call a gravimetric polytope, and what that is is uh, when you spin a mass or rotate a mass, uh, that mass is in a is uh, they, they consider that to be an accelerated frame. So uh, you know, correlating that with SR, you, a rotating mass is actually a uh, it's a first order SR effect. Oh, okay. And SR being gravitational. Okay. Um, it's uh, you know a change in SR. Okay, it's going to form you know what I call these uh, gravimetric polytopes. Oh, in other words, um, because it's in another dimension, because it's rotating through the fourth dimension of time, it's actually forming a shape with a different geometry. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And this gets into Hoagland's work. Okay, with hyperdimensional physics. And it's most likely scalable, you know, from the universe all the way down to atoms, atoms and molecules, okay, how they form crystalline shapes. Those are actually uh, what I think are gravitational shapes. Oh, okay. Okay, okay they form these polytopes. And this geometry is such that you can actually walk into it um, at, a, at a gravitational mystery spot because these spots are all over the world and they form a grid pattern. And I thought that was rather amazing when I first heard about it. They form a grid pattern. I thought, I thought it was rather incredible. And, and that's because the gravitational field of the Earth as it rotates in that fourth dimension may form a, a more complex field pattern, right? Exactly. Exactly. And this is why I think, uh, you know, Hoagland's excited about this. Sure. Well, you know, it makes sense that the Bermuda Triangle, um, you know, in terms of even assuming it's only weather that causes the shipwrecks, um, I've heard that there are triangles equidistant around the planet and other, um, you know, other event sites for things. Uh, some of them, some of them are almost meaningless. It's just known that they're they're spaced almost equidistantly, and the idea being, I guess, if I'm perceiving it correctly, that the Earth has a variety of fields, and that when you rotate those through time. Um, in a way, it's almost like um, it's almost like spinning a child's top. You see a, a ring instead of a, a you know uh, instead of just a whatever the object looked like before. Um, right. Yeah. It, it's a hyper shape of that object. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. That, and that you can explain. correlate all this all this back to uh, you know Newton's f equals m a that a term is a first order s r effect. Oh. It's okay. It's an s r gravitational effect. Okay. Well, uh, we're almost out of time for today, but is there anything you'd like to say in close? <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, is there anything you'd like to say before we uh, close up for today? Uh, well, um, you know, this research is, uh, you know, still going on. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I still want to develop the math uh, for all this. Uh, put together this this new relativity. You know that's what I'm working on here. Um, but but things are looking uh, very very interesting. You know I would say. Yeah. Well, thanks again for your time, Bill. And I will definitely be staying tuned to see uh, what what comes out of your website, the Intalic.com website in the future. And uh, you know I sincerely appreciate uh, that you're doing this work because it, it needs to be done, and you do an excellent job with it. And I also appreciate your time today to uh, to explain a little bit about it to me. So, thanks again for your time, and uh, have a nice day. Okay, Deb. Okay. Thank you for having me on. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye.